have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Very good job, Brother Larry. Luke chapter 22. This morning, and the title of my sermon morning, this morning, The Last Supper. The Last Supper. Next week, we're going to be doing Palm Sunday. So next week, we're going to back up. We've been uh, in the last week of Jesus' life for uh, several months now. Uh, but next Sunday, we're going to back up and go to the, the, the Palm Sunday or the triumphant entry of Jesus. And then the next Sunday, of course, is Easter. So we're going to go ahead of where we are uh, to the resurrection. And then after that, I'm going to come back to the middle and get back into the week, uh, the last week of Jesus. Because I don't want to uh, skip over any of this. There's so much good stuff here. But my sermon today is considered the Last Supper. The Last Supper was the Last Supper in that it marked the end of one dispensation and the entry into another. It instituted the age of the new covenant. The Last Supper is unique, never to be reenacted. It is the closing of one chapter and the beginning of a new one. It was the inauguration, in other words, of a new church ordinance. Uh, although it was not recognized as such at the time, but the church was going, to, uh, going back to this celebration, and we do often, we do it every fifth Sunday here uh, as a recognition uh, of what Jesus done for us in his, his, uh, his life, his blood, and his body. And so the church will go back to this celebration as, as its historical roots, in other words. And again, we do that. We call it communion. That's what we do. So even though the disciples didn't understand it and didn't realize it at the time, at the Last Supper, and then that, that uh, event of the communion at the Last Supper, that it would become a church ordinance. But it did. So let's read the scriptures here. Verses 7 through 18 this morning. And it says, Then came the day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare, uh, prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the uh, guest chamber where I should eat the Passover with my disciples? And he, and he shall show you a large up, uh, upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as it had said, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, Will the, uh, uh, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, This is, uh, or take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the kingdom of of God shall come. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the hour. We thank you for the blessings and the opportunity to be here. God, just fill us, Lord. Fill this room with your sweet spirit. Father, again, we just pray for those who cannot be here, and especially, Lord, we lift up the lost. God, we pray for those who have no concern on this Sunday morning to be in church. They have no desire. They have no conviction, God. But I pray the Holy Spirit of God reach out to them. Lord, to show them and help them to understand that they're walking the path of hell, and Lord, they need to turn around and come to you, Father. They need to come and serve you and, and, and love you as you love them, Father. Lord, your arms are always open to whoever will come. But God, again, thank you for this day. Fill us, Lord. Help me as I stand in this pulpit, God. I just want to reflect you. I want to speak, Lord, being uh, 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 your voice, Father, and nothing else. Get me out of the way, Lord. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. My first point this morning is the Passover, or preparing for the Passover. Jesus uh, sends Peter and John to prepare. Now, Jesus sent two of his disciples uh, to make the necessary preparations, uh, uh, two of his most uh, trusted disciples, and that is Peter and John. They were two of the three that were of the inner circle there. The inner circle there, those disciples were Peter, James, and John. But Jesus uh, sometimes took these three along and met with them and did other things with them apart from the others. Uh, what was so important that two of his most trusted disciples 
had to prepare the Passover. Well, this beca uh, becomes even uh, uh, more evident in the direction Jesus gave as the place of the Passover in the meal where it's to be eaten. Now, if I was Peter and John, I would have been somewhat uh, distressed by Jesus' direction. Now, I, if you look at what he says, he just says, go in to the city, go into the city, and, and there's a guy going to meet you bearing a pitcher. That's it. There's a guy going to come up to you, and he's going to be wearing, he's going to be carrying a pitcher of water. Now, he did not give the name, no kind of address of the man or any kind of arrangements of where it's going to be. He just said, there's a man coming. He's going to be carrying a pitcher of water. You go follow him. Now, the disciples were sent on what amounted to be kind of like a treasure hunt. All they knew was they were looking for a man carrying a pitcher of water. Now, how would you feel if somebody told you something like that? You know, just, just go down to a, a big area in the middle of town and just wait for a guy carrying a pitcher of water. Now, you might be a little skeptical. I, I mean, uh, I believe I would. But they went. Why? Because they believed what Jesus said. Folks, we can believe what Jesus says. Amen? Jesus said, just go down to the city. They had no, they had no understanding where they're at. They just, they just went. And what happened was the Holy Spirit leads them to the place where they need to go, where the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where they realize it or not, and here comes a man with a pitcher of water. It even, it don't even say that the man even spoke to him. It doesn't say that. It just says, here comes a man, he's going to meet you, and I want you to follow him. Had it not been for Jesus, given the instructions, one would probably not even been inclined to even follow those plans, would we? Excuse me. <coughs> I'm tickling in my throat. Yeah. This is similar also to the event we're going to see next week. We're going to see next week when we talk about Palm Sunday that Jesus tells two disciples what? To go into the town. And what's going to happen? He's going to they're going to walk up to a dog. They're going to have a man with a colt and his donkey. And it's going to be tied up. You just go up and, and untie it and bring it to me. And if it has any questions, just tell them the master has need of it. And that's it. Now, again, would you, if somebody told you to go in, in the town and there's going to be a, a horse tied up, or let's put it in our days, there's going to be a car sitting there. You just get in it. Keys are in it. Crank it up and bring it to me. Would you do that? I wouldn't think so, would you? But, again, these men trusted the word of God. <clears throat> if there's anything we need to do today, that is we need to trust the Word of God. Amen? We can depend upon the Word of God. Whatever God says, we can count on it. We can believe in it. Others may not, but if you've got faith in Jesus and He tells you something, then believe in it. Be inclined to understand it. Whatever is going to take place, it's going to be all right because Jesus says it's going to be all right. I'll get into that more. <clears throat> But again, they win. There's also a note of urgency expressed here in verse 7. For the day come when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. The Passover must be celebrated in Jerusalem and the lamb had to be sacrificed and eaten at that point in time. Matthew's gospel, even more em emphatic here. It says this, he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher say, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. <coughs> they were to prepare a, a Passover meal with included the lamb, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, uh, 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 also known as the bread of affliction or of the bread of humility. It was to recognize, uh, it could be recognized by the dark stripes and the piercings uh, uh, in it, which was caused by the hot oven. But anyway, of course, it was unleavened or made without yeast. And yeast is a biblical symbol of sin. The Passover, this Passover was a time uh, to give thanks to God for his great deliverance. Uh, in other words, the exodus. So the Passover was a celebration of the Israel coming out of Egypt. We know what happened there. Now, if I don't spit this out when I preach, that'll be all right. <laughs> the Passover was a time to give thanks to God.
So this is what the whole celebration was. This is the reason the crowd was there. This is what Jesus was coming, and he had always celebrated it, but it was going to be different this time. But I want you to notice this. Jesus, by his sovereignty, prearranged the guest room. My next sub point. Christ controls every circumstance of his life and his death. Jesus orchestrated every act to lead him uh, 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 to, to the very hour in which he uh, would give his life. Now, we looked at this very thing last week in last week's sermon about how Jesus is in control of everything. Everything up to the leading of his death, Jesus orchestrates it. God orchestrates it. So Jesus, in his sovereign arrangement, for a, 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 he arranged for a male servant to carry a water jug. Now, listen to this. Now, we've got to understand that we talked about a water jug here and a man carrying it. Back then, that was unusual. It was the women carrying the water jug. Mm. Things are different, huh? That reminds me of something. I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna <laughs> discuss this. Ain't part of the sermon, but I'll tell you. I had a, a, a good friend. He was an Indian preacher. He was Indian. He was a preacher, and he told me, "says You know something? So we had it made. These white men showed up." <laughs> I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, before you white men showed up, the women walked behind us. And before you white men showed up, all we had to do was hunt and fish. And when we brought the, the game in, the women cleaned it and cooked it. And since you white men showed up, you messed it all up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Jesus in his sovereignty had planned for a servant at least, or a male to be carrying a water jug, a pitcher jug, and to come and to meet them. They, he was going to, actually, the man would find them. Because it says here, the man would meet them. So Jesus, in his sovereignty, did something totally unusual. He has a man, probably more likely a servant, to meet them, which was unusual because usually it's a woman's job to carry water. And he would lead them to the house. And again, it doesn't mention that they say anything. So again, the point that I want you to understand this morning, you can trust God, you can trust his word, you can trust his leadership. When you feel led by God to do something, to say something, to go somewhere, you just follow God's instructions Amen. by his Holy Spirit. God will be there. Amen? Amen. So these guys, they, they go into town, no questions, and here comes the guy, and they follow him. What amazing. This is a wonderful truth to be seen in this verse. Whenever God truly calls us to do something in which we feel unprepared to do, and that there, there are loose ends which seem ill-defined, we, uh, we should discover. Now, folks, I'm telling you, I've seen it in my own life when I felt like I need to do this, when I felt like I've been drawn by the Holy Spirit to do this, and God's already there working when I get there. He's already made preparation. He just needed me to follow his direction and be obedient. I promise you, if God is pulling you and tugging at your heart through his precious Holy Spirit to do something, to say something, to visit somebody, to call somebody, then I suggest you do so, and, and you'll find out that God's there waiting on you. Amen? Amen. Do it. These two disciples were, uh, would surely not have felt in control of this situation, just as the two disciples who were to fetch the donkey in Jerusalem. But in each case, in each text, they found things exactly as the Lord had instructed. Amen? I want you to know that God is obedient. I mean, God is merciful, and God is wonderful, and God is always there and preparing if you'll just be obedient to God's call. These men were obedient. And again, I have found so many times when God has called me to do something, or God has called me to visit somebody, that God is already there and preparing and making the way. And by the, by the way, when, you know, when it comes to visiting somebody, when you want to visit somebody, you're thinking about somebody, God lays someone on your mind to go witness to, the best thing you can do is start out by prayer, amen? You pray about it to start with. And you pray that God's Holy Spirit will meet you there. It's already there. Go with you there. That, 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 that everything will work out according to God's will. Don't try to go out and do things on your own. Amen? Don't jump ahead of God either. You always pray. Every day you need to get up and pray about God putting somebody in your face that you can witness to. 
You need to pray to God every day that God will lead somebody to you or lead you to somebody that you can pray over and lead them to Jesus. There's a whole world out there hurting that needs to know Jesus. Amen. Amen. But what we need to do is trust God. What we need to do is trust the word. His, the, the Bible says for us to pray. The Bible says for us to trust. The Bible says for us to go and, and share the gospel. The Bible says for us just to believe. Just believe. We need to believe in the Lord, and we need to believe his word, and his word is true. Amen? Now, the next thing. Partaking of the Passover. The celebration, the Lord's celebration. He celebrated the Passover every year of his life. This one would be more powerful, though. This celebration, this Passover would be more powerful, more emotional, more vivid, more dramatic than any Passover in his life. Why? Because he realizes that this Passover... He had seen many lambs. He had seen many sacrifices made at Passover. But this time he understood that he would become the sacrifice. He understood that this Passover, that's the reason he was so emotional. This was the reason he was so desiring to be with his, his uh, disciples. Is that he knew this would be the last one. He was going to go and sacrifice his life for your sins and mine. Amen. 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 He knew. He knew what was going to happen. Now, as they met at this Passover, there's little information to us about what they did at this ritual. You know, we, we don't understand, we don't understand if Jesus fully followed out the whole ritual of the Passover in which they done, but it doesn't matter. What we do know is that Jesus added something to that. We're going to get into that later in another sermon. But Jesus approached this, this meal with eagerness. No, but his, and, and, and we read this, he says, I eagerly desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer there in verse 15. This is very strong language, by the way. You can't, you can't actually get this kind of language in English because what it says in Greek, it says, with desire, I desire. So when, back then when they wanted to really emphasize something, they said it twice. Grace unto grace. Glory unto glory. Just like this, desire unto, go, uh, uh, unto uh, upon desire, in other words. So it was something very emotional. It was very intense. And I believe that the disciples felt that intensity. They understood that intensity, that this was a very important celebration, that something great was going to happen just moments away in truth. So this is a great passion of Jesus. It's as if Jesus is saying, this has to happen. This is essential. I have earnest desire. I have a desire with desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, I don't believe the disciples truly understand what he meant still yet about the suffering part. You see, the disciples still wanted to rule and reign earthly. They wanted to defeat the Romans. They wanted to rising up and destroy the Romans and that the Israelites would come in power and they would rule and reign with Jesus. That's not his plan. That's not God's plan. Even after he's telling them time and time again, they don't quite see it. But here was a strong inner desire by Jesus. He loved his disciples to the uttermost. His great love would, would shortly lead this spotless son of God to suffer the most worst death ever. I want you to think about He knew what was about to happen. He knew how horrible uh, it was going to be. The reason why he can say that he has eagerly desired to eat the Passover is revealed there in verse 16. He will not eat again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So two for the cup, he says. He says, I'm not going to eat this with you again. This is the last time. Uh, I'm not going to eat it again uh, until... The kingdom of God is fulfilled. So in other words, again, that's the reason we come up with the last Passover. This was, or the last supper, this was a passionate moment for Jesus. It wasn't so much that he was saying goodbye to his disciples as much as, as now he arrived at the central reason why he has come to, for man. It institutes a new covenant with man based on his own sacrifice. You see, God instituted Passover 
back in Exodus chapter 12. And God incarnate into the, it that night before his death. I'll explain that a little more. This was not the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the beginning. And those disciples didn't understand it at that moment. He was informing his disciples that they were at a turning point in history. They were at a turning point. He would not celebrate his Passover with them again until the kingdom of God had come. Now Jesus knew what was coming. He knew that this was going to be the last night he would spend with his disciples before his death. I can only imagine again the powerful emotion he was feeling. But it began to surge up and well up in him. He knew he was the Passover lamb. This was the final Passover, the final great picture of his death. And his death was, it was, it was going to happen. It was imminent. Imminent. There we go. A few hours later, when he went into the garden, he sweat great drops of blood. So the, the trauma on his physical body, knowing what he knew in his heart was going to take place. Have you ever gotten so sick because you knew what was going to happen to you sometime? Huh? Have you? I, have you ever gotten so you just feared and worried? You know, my, when I was growing up as a kid, the most dreaded words I hated <clears throat> was from my mama. Look, wait till your daddy gets home. Amen. <laughs> you know too, Terry, huh? I knew what I was in for. I knew what was going to happen. And to be honest with you, those hours that slowly ticked away till daddy got home was the most torturing hours ever, right? Yeah. Can you imagine Jesus yeah. knowing that he was going to be rejected? He knew that his disciples would flee him. He knew that he would be lied about. He knew that he was going to have to face a mock court. He knew all that. He knew that he was going to be beaten to a pulp. He knew that they were going to take that can of nine tails and they were going to fasten him to a pole and they were going to take that can of nine tails with 32 licks, that can of nine tails that had rocks and bones, all kind of jagged, jagged edges in it, tied into it, woven into it, and they knew that it was going to come across his back 32 times and it was going to rip the skin literally and the hide off his back. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that they were going to take him on a hill called Mount Calvary. He knew that he was going to be forced to carry the cross. And so weakened, so beaten, so badly, so bloody, and, and just uh, you know, near at the point of death from the beating, he had to get help to carry the cross to Calvary. And there they drove big wooden long, I mean uh, metal long pegs or, or spikes into his feet, his hands. Thank you, wife. He knew that was going to happen. He knew that when he gave up the ghost, they weren't through with punishing his body. He knew that they were going to take the spear and they were going to jab it into his rib cage, and their water and blood would flow out. He knew all that was going to happen. So can we grasp a little bit of his emotion? Can we understand just a little bit of how he felt as there at, the, at, at, at that Passover? He wanted that time with his disciples. He was just moments away from the Garden of Gethsemane where he'd sweat great drops of blood. Think about all these emotions. Think about everything that's going on in his body. And I want you to understand this about everything else. He did it for you. He did it for you and I. He did it so that you can have a, a life in heaven. He did it so you can live, have a life called abundant life through Jesus Christ. If you'll just come under the blood, if you'll just submit your life to him. He did it for you. He did it for you. Do you trust him this morning? Do you believe him this morning? Does he have your life this morning? Do you have him in your heart this morning? Jesus says, men, this is the last time until my kingdom is set up. 
Look at verse 16. Until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God means that the kingdom of God is going to bring about a fulfillment that would include another Passover. Verse 18. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. Both verses indicate that yes, there will be another meal. Yes, another time when we gather around the table and celebrate the Passover. Yes, Jesus will convene such an event in the future. In the millennial kingdom, in the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, he returns and sets up his kingdom. And in that millennial kingdom, there will be a, a reinstitution of the Passover. Now again, I said this was the last supper. This was the last Passover. Note to the point back to the Exodus, but the point back to the cross. When, when Jesus has this Passover in the new millennium, in the, in the new kingdom, when he sets it up, it will point back to the cross, not to Exodus in Genesis, uh, uh, back in Genesis when they come out of uh, uh, Egypt. But it will point to the cross of Calvary. That will be the celebration. And I know all over the world today, the Jews celebrate today the, uh, the Passover still yet. It means a lot to them traditionally and historically. But I want to tell you something. If you reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your religion is false. Your Passover is meaningless. Amen? There is no legitimate Passover until the millennial Passover. Jesus said, this is it. I'm setting, this is the turning point. I'm bringing in the new covenant. And the new covenant was fulfilled in Christ giving his life on the cross. For the disciples at the end, indeed, for the Jews, this Passover meal had a very different significance. For, they, for then it was the end of one order and the entrance into another. And again, why this was happening, they didn't fully understand it. Yes, they would after the resurrection. They come to understand the full meaning of what Jesus did on this night of the Last Supper. And the, and the, and the impact upon their lives was tremendous. It spelled out the end of the Mosaic Covenant and the inauguration of the New Covenant that which the prophet Jeremiah prophesied back in Jeremiah chapter 31. <clears throat> that which God promised Abraham was to be realized and accomplished through the faithful obedience and sacrificial death of the Messiah whose death inaugurated a new order based upon the New Covenant. So the next Passover will be in the New Kingdom kingdom of God. What Christ does here is he ends the celebration looking back to God's delivering power in Egypt. And he inaugurates a new mo a memorial looking back to the cross and the deliverance that was far greater accomplished. Not for one nation, but for us all. Look, let, me, let me just draw a picture for you. There will be another Passover celebration. It will be in the millennial kingdom. And when that, uh, when the Lord comes back, and he's coming back, do you believe that? Amen. I believe that. I'm going to tell you something. I, 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 I've, been, I've been witnessing this man for a long time. And he's kind of messed up in his belief and his religion. And it was just a couple weeks ago. You know what he told me? He said, I, I'm, I'm getting my family in church, man. He said, I'm telling you what, all these signs point to the end of time. And I said, hallelujah. He's finally coming around. He said, I'm getting my family in church. He said, I, I believe the end is near. Uh, I do too. I mean, just look at the sign. Look what's happening. I believe it's about time for Jesus to come back. I believe that the rapture can happen any time. Are you ready? You see, the question here today is this. Do you trust the Lord in his word? Do you trust that, that he's coming back? He says, I'm coming back. There will be another Passover. The question is, will you be in the Passover? Will you make that Passover meal? You see, the only way to make that Passover meal and be in that new kingdom of God is to be under the blood of Jesus Christ, to know him as Lord and Savior of your life. Folks, does the cross of Christ Jesus mean anything to you? I want you to understand the cross and the resurrection is everything. And without it, you're, you're doomed to a devil's hell. Do you trust the word of God? Are you willing to step out in faith and say, I believe? Just like these disciples that stepped out and said, yes, Lord, I'll go. Just on the instructions to go in the town, stand there, there are men come up, meet me, carrying a water pot, and I'm just going to go follow him. He's going to lead me 
me to his master, and I'm just going to say, where's your upper room? Because the master said, yeah, we need to prepare. And they did. That's all the information they had. Folks, I want to tell you something. Right now, the information you need, and you need to decide on this, do you believe that Jesus is coming? Do you believe that it could happen in the time? Because if you have those beliefs, I'll tell you this, you begin to walk right, you'll begin to talk right. You'll begin to get into his word. And you'll begin to share his word to all those around you. Folks, Jesus is about ready to come. Next week, we celebrate Palm Sunday. But Jesus rode in there, I'm telling you, on a donkey. But listen to me. He rode into to Israel on that donkey. So all those shouts of hallelujah and then that crowd turned on him and they nailed him to the cross. But I want to tell you something. I'm looking for him to ride in on a stallion. I'm looking for him to ride in on his victory horse. I'm looking for him to come back not as a weak Jesus. Oh, but I'm looking for him to come as a victor. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I believe with all my heart it can happen anytime. And because of that belief, I know I know I'm going to make that last of that next Passover meal. Are you going to be there? Will you make the Passover meal? Will you? You see, I've never celebrated the Passover meal. I'm not Jewish. But I'm telling you this, I'm a child of God, and when he holds it again, I'm going to be there. What about you? You see, that's the question. That needs to be answered. So many people are gambling with their lives. So many people. So many people today want a religion. I, I like what I heard this morning. It's called a hot tub religion. A hot tub religion. They want to feel warm and cozy and in their sin. And they want to send the full, they want to sit in the congregation and hear a preacher say it's okay. Folks, there ain't no such thing as a hot tub religion. Where you can live your life like you want to and just believe that you're all right with Jesus. You can't continue in your sin. Expect the word of God or any preacher that's preaching the word to comfort your heart if you're not living right. Do you know if you're not living right or not? Do you know Jesus? See, I'm going to close it out. I'm going to ask you one question. Are you prepared today for the Passover? Jesus told those disciples, prepare for the Passover. Prepare for the Last Supper. Are you prepared for the next Passover? Are you? As she comes to play. That's the question today. Do you trust his word that there's going to be another Passover? As she plays, will you stand with me? I want to tell you something. Jesus went to that cross and died for you. You see, I believe in all my heart that his time is drawing near. Jesus don't know the exact moment when he's coming back. Only the Father knows according to the word of God. But I believe in my heart that he's getting anxious. I believe that he's getting excited. I believe he's having one of those desires to desire to be with me. Among you. I believe he could come back. And I want to tell you right now, I don't care what you've done, I don't care where you've been, I want you to know that Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior died for you and he wants to fellowship with you over that next Passover meal. But are you prepared? He told those disciples, go prepare. Are you prepared? Are you ready right now? Are you covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who died for you? Are you ready? this altar is open. Maybe you need to pray for somebody. Maybe your family's in a turmoil. You need to come and pray. Maybe someone in your life is sick. You need to come and pray. There's a world of sin out there. Maybe you need to come and pray. Things in our country are looking Are you prepared?
prepared for the last, or the next, excuse me, I keep saying last, the next Passover. Are you ready? I believe Jesus is dying. I believe he desires to desire to be with us. I believe that. Are you ready? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come today, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your most holy and wonderful word, dear God. We know it's the truth, Father. And Lord, we know that we can follow your word, trust it, no matter what. Lord, you told those two disciples just to go in the town and stand there, and they'd be met by a man carrying a water pipe. It's all the information they needed because of the one who gave that information. Lord, as I look at this word, your holy word, and I get all this information out of this book that you've given us, it's all that we need to lead a life that is a holy life, to lead a life that is filled with abundance and victory, God, I pray if there's anyone here today that's lost and don't understand what I mean, that the day will be a turning point in their life. Just as uh, Jesus was telling or sharing with those disciples that this was the end of one thing and the beginning of another. Lord, it can be that way to a lost soul today. Lord, they could get new life. They could put the old life to rest and come to you, Father. Lord, I pray for their soul. I pray again for those who are sick. I pray for our world, Lord. God in heaven, bless us, Lord, this day. Keep us safe as we go out into the world. Forgive us where we failed you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.